our very own centennial celebration and an upfront look at Blacks in Television as Essence goes to Houston to be among the stars. All this today on Essence. I'm Susan Taylor, and today's show is a milestone for Essence. It's our 100th nationally televised show. And we're down here in Houston, Texas, at the convention where it all began for us. It's the National Association of Television Program Executives Convention. It's better known as NACB. This is where, once a year, the decision makers in television get together. They come from all over the country to look at the shows being offered for the upcoming season. It's here that they'll select the majority of programs that you'll see on your local stations. You know, when we first came five seasons ago, Essence was the only black-owned production company to have its own booth at the convention. And we literally had to walk around telling people who we were and where we were. But despite the odds, we were noticed. And here we are, 100 shows and five seasons later. Today, we're starting to see more and more black ownership, both creative and financial. There's Oprah and Frank's Place, Bustin' Loose, 227, of course, Cosby, and the longest running of us all, Soul Train. Those are the names you know, but you may not know the names of the people behind the scenes who fought to bring black images to television. Names like Tapa and Alice Carew. They're highly respected independent producers who began in public television years ago. They now produce movies as well as shows for commercial television. Theirs is a real love story of each other, their culture, and their craft. money come from okay we were on our way from school and it was raining really hard so we went into a phone booth to call you that's right and there it was on the floor a wet disgusting paper bag full of money <laughs> didn't you ask anyone if the money belonged to them Mimi we were the only people in the phone booth <laughs> while in fact Bustin' Loose is my first commercial television series it is in fact my 12th series so I've been doing it uh, for 20 years. Because they've been producing television for 20 years, Tapa and Alice Carew are black pioneers. Through their two production companies, Rainbow TV Works and Golden Groove Productions, the Carews have fought to bring quality images to television's programming. The then Boston-based nonprofit production company, Rainbow TV Works, supplied the PBS network with dozens of programs, including two highly acclaimed children's programs, Rebop, and the first domestically produced situation comedy for PBS, The Righteous Apples. This Hallmark series featured a multicultural cast and consistently sought to educate viewers on social issues, such as drug abuse. <laughs> hey, listen. <laughs> You better be cool with these uppers, girl. I know what I'm doing. Since then, the Carews have relocated to Hollywood, forming Golden Groove Productions for commercial ventures. These profit-making ventures include the motion picture DC Cab and features for cable television networks, such as The Young Landlords, Two of Hearts, and The Grand Baby. Uh, over the years, as a consequence of being a producer, you know, I've managed to bring a couple of hundred actors into the union. Uh, I brought, uh, you know, 10 or 12 writers into the Writers Guild. I brought five directors into the Directors Guild. Another, you know, 30, 40, 50 people have gotten their first jobs in this business through me. Our struggle has gone beyond um, trying to increase the numbers of blacks on camera to increasing the number of blacks who supply programming and who own production companies that make major feature films because I think if we solve the problem at that level then you will see more black faces, you will see better images. I think it has to trickle down from that. <laughs> 
The Carew's Golden Groove Productions, in a partnership with media giants MCI and Tribune, is the only black-owned production company that currently airs a series in prime time, the syndicated Bustin' Loose. As black producers who've made their mark by bringing quality images to the screen, the Carews are keenly aware of the need to present black people in our full richness, as opposed to the one-dimensional stereotypes so often seen on television. Comedy is basically built on stereotype, and the challenge is how to conceive a product that will be appealing to the black community, not violate the social, cultural, political integrity of myself or of my parents and my sisters and my brothers and my children, and uh, uh, hope and design that product in such a way that it will have an even broader appeal, while at the same time recognizing that an idea is purest at its moment of conception. From that point on, it's all compromise. The black television viewer is, is key and critical to the future of free television in America. Um, you know, we're not pay television subscribers. Uh, we don't rent as many VCRs. We watch free television. As soon as we can begin to quantify more and more the significance of black viewers to uh, television America, the more changes we'll begin to see on the screen and behind the camera. I think the only real power comes from ownership because it is the only way you can control what you do control what is seen on the air, control who works behind the scenes, and um, it is the only way you absolutely know for sure what is going to be represented and how you're going to be represented. People of color can break through if they do what uh, people like me or people like Don Cornelius have done. Forge partnerships, but keep equity. In other words, be in partnership with the big companies, but make sure that the partnership is a true one where you split profits, where you just don't work for the man. Black ownership is important first because of image and perception, because it demonstrates that you can do something. It's vitally important economically because you're in control, so then that means you can recycle dollars to your community that will be able to spin off to help other blacks that are less fortunate than yourself and also give hope and inspiration to them so they can be a part of the same thing in the business where they can look up and identify success and they can look, see leadership and ownership where you're just not being on the field and when you get the bumper crop, the boss say, my, my, we got a bumper crop. Welcome back to Essence and our 100th show. We thought this convention of television programmers would be an appropriate place for Essence Entertainment correspondent Christopher Vaughn of The Hollywood Reporter to take a historical look at black images on television. Because you and I watch television, we have witnessed events we will never attend, visited places we will never set foot. I have a dream formed opinions about people we will never meet, such as the power of television, a single setting where the good, the bad, the accurate, and the distorted are given equal legitimacy. In the intimacy of your home, television touches you, and you are changed. Because television is so immensely powerful, it's clear that the images presented on television have an immeasurable effect. This is an examination of the images that television projects about us as African Americans. Why those images are selected, how they are selected, and most importantly, by whom. To begin, television is a business. A business of delivering the largest possible number of viewers to advertisers. This affects the way that most images are selected in two ways. First, television programming must not conflict with the advertiser's image and attitude. Second, it must appeal to the majority of potential viewers. So we see that in large part, viewer expectation can determine which images will be selected. For it is in meeting those expectations that television draws viewers. Mm -hmm. 
the earliest image the television presented of African Americans was no different than the image presented of whites. During television's experimental years, the 1930s and into the 1940s and 50s, advertisers sponsored entire programs which were aired locally, bringing entertainment to the tube and creating what has been called vaudeville in a box. Pianist Hazel Scott's 1950 program and the original Showtime at the Apollo in 1954 were just two of the black talent showcases of that early television era. In 1959, Harry Belafonte's variety show made him the first black person ever to win television's Emmy Award. And nighttime too. Plagued by troubles in attracting and holding sponsors because of boycott threats from Southern whites, many shows, including Nat King Cole's National Network First in 1956, were dropped. Television is a showcase for black entertainers, but that exposure has fluctuated over time. The late 60s and early 70s were a high point. More than a dozen entertainment programs were hosted by black celebrities, including Sammy Davis Jr. in 1966 and Flip Wilson in 1970. Black entertainers are integral to television. Some would argue that our image as entertainers is non-threatening, therefore acceptable. Others feel that the presentation of our best talent on television has been a powerful force in the push for social inclusion of all black Americans. Another early black television image is surely burned into the memory of all Saturday morning TV viewers the ever-present native. The damage done to generations of viewers by the distortions that were passed off as African cultures cannot be measured. Never seen as masters of their environment or captains of their fate, an entire world view has been shaped as consumers of this television fair were directed to dismiss the integrity of a people and their culture, cultures which stand as the earliest known civilizations on the earth. Show. who spends most of her time in the kitchen but never seems to know what's cooking when may i expect dinner Harry. that early stereotype was soon joined by an equally distorted genre the mammy the maid the handyman all gathered for the singular purpose of serving the white households to which they were attached familiar from motion pictures and years of stereotyped imagery Audiences were delivered such programs as the 1950 show, Beulah. Defenders of this series point out that it offered a look at a black woman who spoke English correctly and performed her duties with dignity. This same defense has been given for the eternally controversial series, Amos and Andy, which premiered on television in 1951. Although the main characters have stood for all time as classic coons, supporting characters presented a flip side to their comedic presence. These straight men were some of the first black judges and businessmen that viewers would encounter. In addition, Amos and Andy provided the very first look at a black household in the history of television. Mama, do you have to get a job? Oh, darling, if we want to stay in this nice apartment, I do, yes. It took television over a decade to once again focus on the black household. The most notable was the 1968 series, Julia, starring Diane Carroll. This program like so many that would follow, was criticized for presenting an unrealistic or fantasy image of black people. To present only these kinds of black people as acceptable, and to insinuate that all black people had such lifestyles was offensive to many who were engaged in the struggle for economic justice and cultural integrity. However, supporters of the program remind us that in this escapist medium, no other television programming is held to the reality test. All agree that the limited number of black images on television places an unfair burden on those that do exist to be all things to all people. Welcome back to Essence. You know, when you think about black people in television, we've been presented as everything from mammies to moguls, from janitors to judges. Here's Christopher Vaughn as we continue to look at black images on television. Reflecting the social awareness of the times, the early 1960s have been called television's age of social relevancy. As network executives acknowledge the purchasing power of black Americans, these decision makers included black issues in this dramatic social debate. In 1963, most major drama series featured at least one episode 
with a racial theme. These searing dramas gave exposure and in many cases Emmy Award nominations to the young black actors and actresses who today are institutions. You are a Negro. A man whose weapons are his life. Confined to racial issues, black actors and with them black images were too often a single episode phenomenon. Recurring television roles remained white. Honor, dignity, our birthright. The late 1960s have been called the golden age of black images on television. The civil rights movement and the emerging black consumer led networks to feature black actors in leading or supporting roles in more than two dozen programs. Most importantly, these characters were largely free of racial stereotyping. I Spy was the first network dramatic series to star a black actor, Bill Cosby. The program was landmark in that it placed Cosby on an equal footing with his white co-star and featured the socially and culturally responsible government agent operating internationally in world affairs. Hey, Pop, I'm home. In the early 1970s, the quality of black images on television declined, swept along in television's move from relevancy to escapism. Solid black characters all but vanished, to be replaced by situation comedy characters like those in the 1971 series Sanford and Son, that critics called stereotypical black characterizations. They likened Good Times character J.J. and his catchphrase, Dynamite, to Amos and Andy's Kingfish and his stock phrase, Holy Mackerel. Hey, bro, say black. However, defenders remind us that these new comedies presented more than just simple cliché. Rather, they were redeemed by the social issues with which they often grappled, issues such as unemployment and racism. While critics saw the black television family as a happy-go-lucky ship of fools, Supporters countered that these programs were no different than their white counterparts, adhering to the exaggerated requirements of situation comedy. Look what I found. <laughs> the late 1970s brought less defensible images. The television notion that black children could be harvested from their environment and planted in white households for comedic purpose. How are today's images of blacks who are attached to white households different from the maids and handymen of yesteryear who existed only when they were among whites? Supporters say these characters may live and work with whites, but are more fully human than their predecessors. Detractors see it as just another of the mutilations that a black character must undergo in order to be acceptable. Hill Street Blues in the late 70s ushered in a stream of strong black characters. Other programs' characters mirrored Hollywood's black exploitation crop of hookers, pimps, and thieves. Black protests soon ebbed this tide, and increasingly, stereotypes and tokens were joined by black images that more accurately reflect our full range of human expression. Black television professionals have joined in what had been a virtually white creative effort, and their mark can be seen on programs like Amen and the blockbuster Cosby Show, programs that treat African-American culture with the dignity it so richly deserves. Many trace the beginning to the award-winning miniseries, Roots. This program's record-breaking viewing audience still stands as one of the largest in the history of television. The Roots phenomenon proved that black images are commercially successful and opened the eyes of network executives, pushing many of them to break the color line in other Good types morning, of programs. Today on a, on a Bryant Gumbel now co-hosts the Today Show, the highest-rated weekday morning news and information yes. program. The syndicated Oprah Winfrey Show is one of the most successful programs on television today. And when the young comedian, Arsenio Hall, hosted the Fox Network's Late Show, he dramatically increased the show's ratings. Indeed, African Americans have had a phenomenal impact on the success of the programs in which they appear. While the number of black characters on television represents only a fraction of our actual percentage in the population, we now see a full range of black characterizations on television. As more whites purchase VCRs and wired their homes for cable, the black viewer is becoming a larger and larger percentage of the audience viewing free television. In addition, due to economic constraints, black viewers watch more hours of TV than their white counterparts. We have seen how programmers respond to the wishes of advertisers and viewers. We have seen a growth in the impact of black television professionals, both on and off camera. With this in mind, 
Who can imagine what the black image on television will become as these factors force programmers to increasingly focus their energies on satisfying the tastes and expectations of African Americans, consumers whose purchasing power equals that of the 11th wealthiest nation on earth. We as a, as a people have a tendency not to, not to think that our voices will be heard or anybody will, will pay attention to it. I'm telling you, they respond because they perceive those letters uh, to have viewership behind them and viewership means dollars. The big difference I see now from 17 years ago is that the future is much brighter. The future is brighter because uh, we're more powerful as an audience. We are more of a factor as black people uh, with respect to what survives on television. Today we took a thought-provoking look at black people and this powerful medium, television. But the real power in television is with you, the viewing audience. In the same way that Cagney and Lacey and Moonlighting were brought back after being canceled, your voice can assure the success of a new show like Frank's Place, your own local black programming, or even the return of the black presence on a show like Dynasty. Believe me, you have the power to create, to shape, and to change what you see on television. Exercise it. Write to us and we'll tell you how. I'm Susan Taylor, and thank you for joining in the celebration of our 100th show. You made it possible. See you next week for 101. Our time is only beginning. We've only just touched what we can be. It's our time. Go find what you're after. Believe in yourself. The world will follow where you lead. We're only beginning, but we're on. Believe in yourself